My name is, hello, my name is David Phillips, and I am an interviewer, volunteer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And I am interviewing Carl Everett on October 24, 2006, at the Pleasant Ridge Library. Our camera operator today is David Duhart. Also present today, are obviously, are myself and Carl. Carl, well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. An interesting thing that I, I do want to mention also is uh, we're going to talk about, obviously, um, Mr. Everett's experiences in World War II, but uh, as an aside, he is also a distinguished electrical engineering professor, and he taught me in night school. Although I remember him, he didn't remember me, but I wasn't that distinguished. I was, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't turn in that assignment. Well, unfortunately, I can't remember everybody that I uh, had, but it's nice to on occasion meet people who still think kindly of the experience. It was a great experience and a good, good learning. But let's start to talk about, uh, I, I see these fascinating uh, pictures here in which um, this one, of course, uh, you have a, a, a cap on, so I'm sure you had a good flock of hair then. Right there. And, uh, and this one uh, shows your progress uh, between 1942 and 1946. And uh, a formidable looking boat, or ship as the Navy would say. Uh, we can probably take a, a look at the USS White Marsh. White Marsh. Okay. And never having been much of a swimmer, Carl, I, <laughs> I went in the Army. Well, that's an unusual ship, so I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, as we go along. Okay. Uh, if you're interested, where I was when the war started. Yes. I was a kid running around the hills of Lawrenceburg, Indiana on a Sunday morning. And I came back from a Sunday morning jog to find that the war had started. Uh, I was a senior in high school. And so I finished high school in 1942. <clears throat> and then I went up to Faustoria, which Ohio, where I lived. Uh, for a number of years before I moved to Lawrenceburg. I still had friends there, so I went to work in a, as a laboratory technician in a factory, uh, 50 cents an hour, as a matter of fact, in uh, Fostoria, Ohio. But uh, the people that I had known before I moved to um, Indiana were still there, my former scoutmaster, for example. And uh, <clears throat> since we were all, at that time, 18 years old and the war was on, we were wondering, you know, what should we do? And uh, the scoutmaster located a program in the U.S. Navy called the Radio Materiel School for Radio Technicians. So uh, I signed up on November 4th, uh, 1942, and was shipped to Great Lakes. And since I was an only son, all this was quite an experience. I was suddenly living now with 2,000 guys in groups of 200 and marching and standing and running and jumping and all the sort of things you do in boot camp. But uh, since I took an examination before I went in, I uh, passed the basics of mathematics and, and electricity and so on. And so I got a rating as a third class petty officer, which was this. So I had a little bit of easier in boot camp because I was in what was called a rated company and we didn't have to do everything that uh, the seamen had to do. But what it meant was as soon as boot camp was over and I got one leave at home for Christmas and then I went back to Great Lakes to start the, the uh, training program in this radio technicians program. And it was rather intensive. Actually, it was 11 months, which is longer than they train most people in the Navy. You know, three months and you're out at sea. But this one program, we had a, a month at uh, Chicago, uh, pre-radio, and then I, they sent me to Bliss Electrical School in Silver Springs, Maryland uh, in the spring uh, for three months. And then I was shipped to Treasure Island in San Francisco for the last six months. And in San Francisco, it turned out that this wasn't just radio training, it was radar, which was very secret at the time to the point we couldn't uh, say the word when we were off the base. It was 
is that new. They, um, we had notebooks, for example, that were locked up in the safe every night when we finished our work. So when I finished the training in, at uh, San Francisco, it was about Christmas of the next year, and I had to wait then for a month or so to be assigned to a ship. I chose to go into the fleet rather than uh, aircraft, which was another option. I had been would have been trained in Texas, but uh, I decided to go into the fleet in the South Pacific. So they assigned me to this ship, which is called Landing Ship Dock. And uh, you could open up the tailgate of that ship and bring in 18 tanks uh, in small tank lighters. So the job was to, my job was to prepare the radios and take care of the radar. And up at the top of that mast was the radar that I had to crawl up the mast to take care of. And I had a little workshop which was right at the end of the mast, at the bottom. So I, I was a, the only radio technician on the ship. And when I went aboard, as a, I made second class out of uh, the radio school, radio material school. When I went aboard as a second class, the executive officer saw these stripes on my shoulder and assumed I was a radioman, so he put me in the radio shack to copy code. And I had to tell him, I don't know how to copy code. And he said, you know, well, what the heck kind of sailor are you here with third class, second class, you can't copy code. So I had to explain to him what a radio technician was, that we took care of all the equipment. Etc. But that didn't satisfy him that that was a full-time job, so he signed me to be the mailman. So I had a branch of the New York Post Office in the bowels of that ship for two years. And there were parts of it were kind of interesting because on payroll day, everybody would bring their money in to me and I'd make out money orders for them to send home. Then I'd give the money to the payroll officer and the next time it was payday, he'd use the same money and pay them over again but with the same money. But um, we left San Francisco in uh, about March of 43 and headed to Saipan, which was the first uh, invasion that I was in. And the job there was to put the radios in the boats and they'd form a pool and go in with the uh, first, second wave. So we were always there in the thick of things. And then we'd stand by and repair the small craft. We went from Saipan through several other islands in preparation for the uh, Philippines. And in supplying the Philippines, uh, we went to New Guinea and picked up troops, took them to the Philippines. So I was in uh, Saipan, Tinian, Peleliu, and two invasions in the Philippines. All in the same boat? Uh, yeah, same. Okay. Yeah, it was the only ship I was ever on. And ended up at Okinawa the last uh, 30 days off Yangtan airstrip. And for the stars that are shown there in the ribbons, we shot down 13 Japanese planes while we were sitting there like sitting ducks in Okinawa. So, finish the narrative and then you can ask some questions if you want. Uh, about the time we've been over for about two years, we were due to go back and be repaired got resupplied for the invasion of Japan. And on the way back, by that time I was promoted to a chief petty officer, so I was kind of living it up a little bit. But uh, on the way back, they dropped the atomic bomb, which ended the war. So I was in San Francisco the night that the official war ended, and it was Bedlam. Uh, but they sent me to a uh, RAN school, which is long range, uh, navigation. And I was supposed to be there a couple of weeks, but they provisioned the ship and pulled me out and put the equipment back on. We headed to Japan. So I was in the occupation of a little naval base uh, on the North Island of Honshu around December of 45. And that was an interesting experience because when we got in there, the Japanese had been told that they were all going to be killed as soon as the Americans got there. So they were lined up on the dock and they were all bowing. There was a man there in a long Lord Nelson Navy hat. We thought we captured an admiral. 
turned out he was a fire chief in the town. <laughs> Had one little beat up fire engine. <laughs> but the um, thing I found remarkable about that was that within about two weeks, uh, the Japanese were waving and we waved. I took some hikes up in the mountains and stuff like that. As soon as the war was over, the Japanese just seemed to have forgotten the whole thing. We um, occupied this naval base and uh, had a friend, a Texan, that wanted to make some uh, bridle for his horse. He didn't have any aluminum. So we saw the propeller off a Japanese plane and we had plenty of aluminum for that, for that sort of thing. We brought back a couple of souvenirs and uh, was discharged in Great Lakes again as we, we came back to San Diego and made another trip to uh, Great Lakes and was discharged. So that's it in a nutshell. That's a pretty good nutshell. Well, it was an interesting experience. I don't know how much more you want to elaborate on it, except that one of the good things that came out of that, A, was the experience, but B, was the GI Bill. And I took advantage of it. And uh, when I came back, I went to Purdue and got my bachelor's and master's degree in the four years on the GI Bill. And it's then when I came to UC and started teaching in 1950. So I stayed there until essentially 19, uh, 1978 and did some other things. So do you have any questions as to how a ship like that works? There's lots of interesting tales. I got some questions uh, sure. taking back to the beginning of when you tested into uh, radio school. I mean, fundamentally, when you joined the Navy uh, and, and took the normal entrance test. Apparently you had been a pretty good high school student also. Yeah, I, was, I did okay in high school. Uh, there were two ratings actually. There was third class and second class. And uh, I apparently didn't score high enough for second class, but I made that before I left the formal training school. And the fact that you went to school for 11 months it was a pretty critical skill. It, it was. Uh, and there weren't many of us in the fleet at that time, so aboard ship, I was the only technician that did that work. And as a consequence, uh, I pretty much made my own schedule, which is unusual for somebody in the Navy. I didn't have to stand any watches because the executive, the executive officer thought, uh, not knowing exactly what I was supposed to do, that I could also be a radar man, which was watching the scope go around and so on. So I had to convince him that uh, if I was doing that, I couldn't be doing the maintenance that was required on all the equipment that I was responsible for. So he finally relieved me of that responsibility as long as I was the mailman. And uh, so I didn't stand a watch until I, from boot camp until I was a chief petty officer and had quarter deck watch with the other chiefs. What were some of your anxious moments on, uh, at, at that young age, how did you recognize how important your particular skill was to the, to the ship? I mean, you, you were the communications guy. Uh, did you ever have any, and since you were the only one that knew what technically was yeah. required, did you have any moments of panic or anxiety or any crisis that, that only you knew about? Well, there was a backup system. If you happen to be in a port, for example, with the radar equipment, there were some civilian technicians from Raytheon that could come aboard and give you a hand. If you were in port? Yeah, if you were in a port or dock someplace. Mm -hmm. I only had that kind of help once with the main radar system, otherwise I took care of it. Uh, one experience I had that indicated that it was a little unusual. We have a, there was a device for decoding information that came into the radio shack. It was a secret decoder, but everybody knows how they work these days. There's a number of rotating wheels, and you press a, a type key down, and these wheels would whir, and then another letter would print, and the, wheel, the wheels were all changed, etc. I had never seen it, and one night the communication officer got me up, middle of the night, and he said, the decoder doesn't work. Uh, can you fix it? I said, I don't know, I never saw it. And so showed it to me and I, ultimately I figured it out in a half hour or so and made the repairs. And uh, the next morning, 
uh, when the captain found out about it, that he said, "Well, you shouldn't shouldn't have done that. You weren't cleared for secret work." <laughs> I said, "Well, don't wake me up the next time." <laughs> But it didn't happen again. Actually, I had some secret clearance because when I moved from the school aboard ship, my notebooks were brought over by guard and were locked up. And when I asked for them so I could install the equipment, again, the executive officer, these guys were naval, new naval reserve officers without a lot of experience, said, well, no, you're not cleared for secret work. And I said, I wrote the notebooks, and I went, no, no. So it took a little while to get the notebooks out. <laughs> Sometimes some, some of the funniest yeah. things can happen, and, yeah. and you're looking back on it now, you get a little humor in it, but well, well, you were blocked from getting something you had already written. Right. Some of the other humorous parts of it, when we first took this ship out into San Francisco Bay, none of the people on the ship had ever been on that kind of ship. It had a big well deck inside and you could ballast the ship down and open the gates and bring in, I think, 12 feet of water inside the ship so you could float all these boats in. And the first time out in San Francisco, and then they started going down 12 feet, we thought, we are going right down to the bottom. <laughs> we weren't sure that the rest of the people knew how to run the thing. But there were, uh, mm, what, about 15 LSDs in the fleet, and we served uh, move from one fleet to another, so that's why I was in so many invasions because there weren't many of these kind of supply vessels. That, uh, a special kind of supply vessel designed and built yeah. for that for that service. Yeah, it had, you wound some, up on it. it had some guns on it: a five-inch gun, and some quad forties, and fifty caliber machine guns. But mostly, it was a big floating dock. Did you ever have to get in and, and man any of the, the weapons? That wasn't my job. My job during uh, battle station was to make sure that all the equipment was running. So I had uh, a battle station right at the bottom of that mask in a little steel box that they closed the cage on me and I was locked in. Mm -hmm. But uh, I made a mistake once of opening the door and stepped out and I got hit in the head with some shrapnel, but I had my helmet on and I stuck my head out. So there were times that things were that kind of Kind of intense. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, fired at the, yeah, the invasions were, there was just ammunition all over. And one night in a convoy, when we were leaving the Philippines, the ship behind us was torpedoed. And um, I've never attended any reunions until about last year. A friend of mine prevailed on me to go to a reunion of LSDMC sailors, uh, LSDM, LSD sailors. LSDMC is the local school decision making committee. I've got that in my mind, sorry. But anyway, as soon as I walked in and, and introduced myself as being from the White Marsh, the guy, first guy said, Oh, you were there when we got torpedoed. And I said, Yeah, I was right behind you. So we had some battle experiences. But he survived, and so he was there. Um, well, one of the interesting things that uh, um, you, you, the question that comes to mind is when the, we went back to Japan after the war ended, and you said within a couple of weeks, you know, there there was, you know, after they discovered they weren't going to be killed, they had put it behind them. Right. Uh, that, that's interesting. Uh, uh, and how about the, the Americans? Had they put it behind them? I think so. Uh, at least the sailors that were on that I dealt with really hadn't been in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the sense that the Marines that we took in were. And uh, the war was over and everybody seemed happy that it was over and we could try to go back to some kind of uh, reasonable life. How did you, when you were in that little steel cage, as you said, you know, you stepped out once and got hit with shrapnel. When all of that uh, bombardment during the invasions was, was, was going on, uh, as, you, as you think back, you're a young man, you know, at that time, any kind of thoughts flash through your mind? Uh, worry, concern, uh, adrenaline? I mean, well, what, what kind of emotions were you experiencing in, in, in your... Well, it was... Uh very dramatic experience, at least the first bombardment, for example, on Saipan, 
because they started with the aircraft bombing the island real early in the morning and we came in the night before and began unloading boats all night long, getting ready so at dawn we were ready to go ashore. So it was, I don't think I suffered from fright because everybody else was doing the same thing. I think when you're in a situation where everybody's moving together, you don't really think about individual things. I had to go into the small boats and uh, install the radios and, and so on, but I wasn't any more danger than anybody else. Inside the uh, repair uh, shop that I had at the base of the mast, uh, I couldn't really know what was going on. I could hear an awful lot of shooting and so on. And, uh, but there was secret equipment, uh, identification, friend or foe equipment in there. <clears throat> then I had orders if the ship was hit that I had to blow it up before I left. So that was part of my responsibilities to destroy the secret aspects of the equipment on the ship. But uh, I don't really f feel or remember any particular feeling of fright other than just uh, it was a job that everybody was doing. I felt more concerned about the guys who were up here in the front end shooting that five-inch gun because there was a few seamen that as soon as the gun fired, these big five-inch cartridges would come out. And these guys were in asbestos suits and they had to catch it as they were rejected. Yeah, they rejected. So I thought, I got a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> all things considered, huh? Yeah, but all things considered. Before you went back to Japan, when you landed in San Francisco and the war had ended because of the, the A-bomb, uh, you said it was bedlam, you know, was it just kind of a lot of, a lot of partying, uh, just happy, uh, people coming together? Well, it was wild scenes on the street. I don't know if you've ever seen the newsreels of the night after the day that the war ended, either in New York or San Francisco. It was just pandemonium, and of course it was... Uh, full of sailors in San Francisco, and everybody was having parties, and uh, it was pretty wild. As a matter of fact, uh, I went back to the ship about midnight, because it was just getting not really very safe on the streets, so I thought, this is kind of silly, so I just went back to the ship. Um, later on, I had, as a professor, I had opportunities to travel in Japan, and uh, <clears throat> I taught three summers in India, and on my way I stopped in Japan. And one Sunday morning I was taking a train from Tokyo to Nikko to see the shrines. And like most Japanese at that period, learning English, they want to practice their English. So there was a young man on the train who uh, said to me, uh, have you ever been in Japan before? And I thought, well, let's see how friendly the people are. And I said, well, only after the war when I was here in the occupation. And didn't phase him a bit. The more we talked, he wanted me to get off the train, go meet his family, and all, all sorts of things. And they're uh, very resilient people. They are. I was impressed. They are. Well, you had uh, the, the, the battle time, you know, as well as the technical time. It uh, provided a good basis for what I chose to do as a professional when I left. The training that I had in the Navy gave me about six months of uh, college credit when I went to Purdue, and that helped a bit. Why did you pick Purdue? Because uh, at the end of the war, so many people were returning and going on the GI Bill, the schools were absolutely mobbed. I wanted to go to MIT. But the arrangement, <clears throat> arrangements at MIT were that you had to go take an entrance exam, and if you didn't pass the exam, you didn't get in, and it was too late to go to someplace else. And I was a resident of Indiana, so I wrote my father, and he had uh, uh, requested registration at Purdue as a resident. So I got out of the Navy in January, and uh, by the 1st of February, I was in college with four guys in a little bitty cubby hole, uh, a room uh, on the third floor of Cary Hall. Uh, but some of the, it was so crowded in those days that some of the veterans returning were sleeping in the gymnasium, which is foot lockers. 
But they were enrolled. Yeah, they were enrolled, and we were in concert huts and so on. But as time went on, of course, the uh, housing improved, classrooms improved. But it uh, was a kind of a cadre of people. I was older than the college students at that time, so I really didn't have much social life in college. In fact, the veterans who were back sort of looked down their noses at college kids. We were there for a different purpose. And More so mature. you really didn't, uh, some of us at least, didn't participate in all of the football games and basketball games. By that time, I was pushing 25 and ready to get out and make a living. Your parents were still in Lawrenceburg? Yeah, they were in Lawrenceburg uh, during that time. Uh, later on, they moved to Georgia. I only came back to Cincinnati as a kind of coincidence that when I finished uh, at Purdue, there was a notice on the bulletin board at Purdue saying that they wanted an instructor in electrical engineering at UC. So I stopped in on a spring vacation and went in to talk to the uh, head of the department. And I, I don't know how familiar you are with universities these days, but become a university professor or an instructor, there's a tremendous rigmarole of interviews and so on. In 1950, I stopped in and talked to uh, Bill Osterbrock, who was the head of the department. And uh, then I went back and I uh, finished the spring work. And about graduation time, I got a call from him. And he said, are you going to be my boy? I said, well, you offered me a job? And he said, sure. Uh, and then by that time, I had an offer from the National Carbon Research Laboratory in Cleveland to come. And the salaries were exactly the same. And I was getting married, so we talked it over and decided maybe we'd like to spend our time in the university. But the salary, 1950, with a master's degree, like the University of Cincinnati, full-time instructor, $3,600 a year. Wow. And that was the same as in, in a research lab in Cleveland. So I got married on $300 a month. You made it work. Yeah. So you came to Cincinnati and started at the university, instructing mm -hmm. in 50. How old were you then? Mm, 50, I was about 26. So you married when you were 26 and yeah. you brought your bride over. Parents still in Lawrenceburg. While I was teaching, uh, there were some nice opportunities. Uh, I had a chance to go to uh, India for three summers in Madras, at the University of Madras, under U.S. aid. And what I was doing, I was teaching Indian professors about computers, computer science. And uh, that was a group of Indians from all over India, and the only thing we had in common was they all spoke English of a kind. It was really quite different. Then I had an opportunity to spend the summer in Romania at the Bucharest Polytechnic Institute that was under UNESCO, which was an interesting experience. And um, one summer in Australia, I wrote some papers on modeling and so on, and an Australian professor came and liked it and uh, wanted me to go back, so I spent one summer in Melbourne uh, at a hospital, actually a cancer hospital. I did a number of things in, professionally at Children's Hospital in terms of computers and computer programs. So it, uh, kind of branched out to where I had some opportunity to travel. Sounds like your, your almost inherent interest in education from the beginning, as you said, you did okay in high school, you have always been focused. And that led to that choice between National Carbon and Cleveland and University of Cincinnati. Kind of was a watershed because it kept you in, a, in, in an education thing, which still today continues. Well, that's, that's true. Although, as a professor of engineering, I always felt that it was important to be an engineer. So during that time, I worked for CG&E as an electrical engineering consultant. And I've always, all the time I was teaching, and when I was teaching classes you were in, not only night school, but I usually had a consulting job with uh, 
some industry. So I've worked for Procter & Gamble and Cincinnati Gas and Electric. But that's to keep your practical... Um, yeah, because you're in, you remember UC was a co-op program. Yes. And our students were out in industry. And I always thought it was very important as a faculty member to keep abreast of what was going on in industry because you know, our students were there. So you kept an oar in both fields. In other words, that, that old adage about those who can't teach is not true. <laughs> I hope not. Right. No, I said something <laughs> true. It, uh, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. And even when I had reached the end of my time at UC, uh, I still wasn't ready to quit. So I sought out another school, Thomas More, across the river, and started a computer science program for them, which was really uh, an interesting experience. And then my wife was working at Xavier. And as a professor in the School of Business Administration, and they asked me to come back and start a whole new program in information sciences for them. So, where do you think this, uh, the, the, this uh, I'll call it skill, or, the, or the, 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 this passion for the kind of thing that you do, reaching out and teaching, you know, teaching engineers or uh, relating to people, you know, your, your thing in India? So for that, after after a, a war in which I saw an 18 year old young man go in and be in invasion type things in the Pacific, come back, go back for occupation, come back to school, happenstance again, can't, can't get an MIT, in other words, it, it wasn't appropriate to take a risk of going and taking those tests. And he went to a very fine school, you know, Purdue. And then you're giving back all the time, you know, you're, you're giving back. And you're, you're an only son? Yes. You have no brothers and sisters? No. Where, where, where did this deep-seated, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to call it, compassion, uh, broad breath, I mean, you're just kind of a renaissance guy. I had an example when I was a kid of a Boy Scout leader who was an engineer, and he was that kind of guy that he could do anything. And when we were in Scouts, I remember going to his apartment with my first experience. There was a whole bunch of kids there with a sewing machine and so on, They're making their own knapsacks. They made their own canteens out of coffee cans, which we soldered up. We made our own uh, equipment. We made a cart that we pushed out in the woods. We got a cabin and we rebuilt the cabin, an old log cabin on a farm. And we rebuilt that one winter. And this man's name was George Crinch. And he was uh, kind of a renaissance guy. He was, later on, it turned out, he specialized in repairing looms. He was a craftsman. He was skilled in painting. He spoke two languages and so on. You know, just a fantastic example. And I uh, kept track of him during uh, practically, well, my whole life. When he died, I started a memorial fund for him. And they, put all his artwork in a room in the library in Foster, Ohio for a while. But uh, I would say as a single inspiration that uh, he was the key to what I was interested in. My father was a chemist too. I used to work in his laboratory, so I had some little interest in my work for him was washing the beakers and stuff, but I was just you know, a kid in his laboratory. But uh, I, I would credit George Crunch probably with directing my interests primarily in education and science. And, and so. I'm sure George is smiling down on you because he, he launched a juggernaut. He was a great guy. Yeah, well, and he cloned one. But the issue here for me is that you never know where inspiration comes from. So it's always so wonderful to, as our legacies, you know, pass on through. Right. Each one teach one and touch one. So that's why I was so interested in, in just what shaped you, you know, because again, you are continually giving back, you know, and reaching out and pushing an envelope around education and, and t t touching people. What, what are your thoughts as we look at our society today? I know you're on Allison, D.C. Uh, for building the Pleasant Ridge School. I know you still do things in the educational forum. And we've got a world right now in which our education system overall 
it's struggling, you know, it's in trouble, uh, we've got issues. And as a World War II veteran, you know, as you look at our current state of affairs, what are some of your reflections, you know, as you compare to when you were in a turbulent time and now we're in a turbulent time? You got any pearls, wisdom, or just thoughts, reflections? Well, the, the turbulence, I think, that I encountered happened suddenly at Pearl Harbor. You know, it didn't build up, and we were suddenly tossed into it. And uh, having survived that and moved on, um, and thinking as things were, for example, when I was in school, I'm very much distressed with the public school system here. We have, uh, in this community, I've been involved in a lot of environmental issues, incidentally, in Pleasant Ridge for 20 years. We've worked to clean up the Hilton Davis site. And so that's been a long-term project uh, that I've been involved in. And the school is most recently in the last four three years that I've been working on that project. But I, I think what happened when the demographics of various communities changed and certain elements fled, that everybody else went to sleep. And my wife and I lived here in Pleasant Ridge for 50 years. We came to Cincinnati and we lived over by the stockyards and off Hopple Street we got enough money to buy a house in Pleasant Ridge. Our children went to Pleasant Ridge School, public schools. And in those days, the public school was essentially an exemplary school. Woodward had uh, uh, AP courses and stuff like that. Uh, then demographics began to change and people fled. And I think everybody went to sleep and the schools deteriorated. I've just been making a review since the year 2000 of the grade records of the Pleasant Ridge School. And in 2000, there were indications that the Pleasant Ridge School, the children were performing about half of what the district was doing, and the district was doing about half what the state wanted in terms of reading. And like 33% of the children in the third grade uh, were able to pass the state reading examination in the year 2000. That should have been a wake-up call. So, uh, having lived in the community and as many roots as I have, I thought it was important to see if we can't turn this thing around. And when we had the opportunity to get a new school, change the educational mode to Montessori, bring in Amberley as part of the picture, when my kids went to school, half of the kids in Pleasant Ridge School were from Amberley. They celebrated Jewish holidays and Christian holidays and so on. And most of those people fled the public school systems as they deteriorated. And uh, now we have an opportunity to turn this thing around, but it's going to be a long haul. But we have a new school, we have a new curriculum, and we've got after school programs. If we can get the teaching staff really inspired, I think we've got a good chance. That's great. David, do you have any questions? Of course. <laughs> um, just one though, um, Mr. Phillips, you did a great job of, of asking some of the questions I would, I would have had. So thank you for that. Um, during the course of your service in World War II, did you meet other types of people that, you know, up till then in your life you, you really hadn't met? It, and, and could you just describe what that experience, that experience was for you? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, David, because that was kind of a major revelation uh, coming from the Midwest without any travel experiences I did. I was thrown in a big naval training station with guys from Boston who had a totally different accent, with guys from New York who thought differently than I did, guys from Texas who thought we were all crazy. And uh, I really was not aware that there was such uh, regional differences in people until I was sleeping in a big dormitory with 2,000 guys, you know, and rubbing shoulders and uh, showers and everything else. So, yeah, it was quite a revelation to me uh, to realize that uh, there was as many different kinds of people 
uh, origins uh, from Chicago, uh, the South, etc. that we had all one purpose of being in the Navy, but uh, there was sure a lot of background differences that took a while to get adjusted to. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Thank you both.